This year's mine excavation team consisted of students under the supervision of Dr. Karkam and Dr. Bahrani, Farzana Hamedi, Sohel Sanipur, Yalen Lee, and Brock Jins. The main objective of this project was to investigate brittle failure and corresponding spalling occurring at the boundaries of the tunnels in an artificial material environment. We were to develop a specimen made out of an artificial material which featured two parallel evenly sized tunnels spaced at 0.5 times the tunnel's diameter. This specimen was to be partially encased in a metal frame to confine the specimen laterally, with the two faces showing the cross sections of the tunnels exposed. The specimen was to be loaded with a distributed load on the top surface with a metal plate and we were to predict and to observe the outcome to such a loading. Laboratory produced data obtained from specimens made from an artificial material consisting mainly of plaster would be used to develop a computer simulated model. This artificial material was selected as it closely resembles brittle failure behavior. It is commercially available and it is workable. The establishment of the design of all components of the tunnel specimen could then be determined and the outcomes could roughly be predicted. The tunnel specimen would be created, loaded to failure and the result observed. In the previous year's mine excavation class, a similar study was conducted by Ryan Zeberth and Saeed Nazuri under the supervision of Dr. Corkum. They simulated a single tunnel in an artificial plaster material with unconfined boundary conditions with a distributed vertical loading. Ryan and Saeed recommended to increase the curing time of the tunnel specimen, ensure that the top and the bottom of the tunnel specimen is level, and to apply confinement at the sides. Ryan and Saeed produced a video titled Spalling in a Massive Rock Under High Stress and can be viewed on Dr. Corkum's YouTube channel. Starting briefly with the theoretical aspect. Adams to model brittle failure dates back to the 1920s, where Griffith studied tensile cracks in brittle material. Evidence regarding the initiation of failure in brittle rock were also observed, and studies were conducted attempting to establish a failure criterion for brittle rock, later leading to the establishment of the Hook-Brown failure criterion. Brittle failure can occur in the form of spalling or slabbing, which are commonly encountered in mining and civil underground tunnels. Detaching slabs from the roof and or side walls can either occur gradually in the form of progressive spalling or when certain conditions are met, in the form of rock burst, with an audible sound in a violent manner. The nature and the extent of the failure are important parameters in tunnel and support design. We needed to select an artificial material find its strength parameters, and a respective curing time. We selected a quick set plaster of Paris to be the main ingredient of our artificial rock material with a small fraction by mass of diatomaceous earth. By mass, our mix design consisted of 45 parts plaster of Paris to one part water and 32 parts water to one part diatomaceous earth. A cylindrical cast made from a longitudinally cut steel pipe was used to produce our representative specimens. The cast when joined had an inside diameter of approximately 54 millimeters and a length of 135 millimeters. The application of a vibratory table was used during the pouring of each specimen and for the duration of the curing time. Each specimen was stored in an enclosed unit with a relative humidity maintained at approximately 50%. An appropriate curing age needed to be determined. To do this, we tested in uniaxial compression, 
eight cylindrical specimens at different curing ages ranging from 5 and 25 days. The curing age versus the unconfined compressive strength were plotted as well as the curing age and the Young's modulus. From both plots it was determined that after 14 days the strength and elastic properties became relatively stable. Three crucial pieces of information were attained at this stage, the unconfined compressive strength, the Young's modulus and a lower bound curing time. A single cylindrical specimen was prepared and cured 14 days for the purposes of obtaining tensile strength data. This specimen was cut into six discs and Brazilian testing was conducted on each disc. A consistent Brazilian strength was achieved and was correlated to a direct tension strength. To get the proper dimensions for the tunnel specimen block, we studied the effect of frame dimension on the stresses acting on it by running a series of elastic models with different block dimensions encompassing two tunnels. It was determined that a suitable design of an artificial material block would have the dimensions of 40 cm by 45 cm by 25 cm. The artificial specimen was prepared in a wooden mold with two ABS pipes placed at the middle. Prior to pouring the specimen, the pipes were taped with a plastic tape at their connection to the wooden mold to prevent leakage. Additionally, to diminish the frictional resistance between the mold and the artificial material, the internal sides of the mold were coated with Vaseline. While on a vibrating table, a specimen was carefully poured. Although the specimen preparation was very critical due to the fast curing time of the plaster, the final look was pretty amazing. Finally, the block was cured for 21 days in an enclosed unit with a maintained relative humidity of approximately 50%. Designing the loading frame was the next step. It was our goal to make a frame that was relatively simple and effective. The metal frame was made of two aluminum side plates tied into the block with a combination of long threaded steel rods with nuts and washers which could easily be adjusted. These rods located at the front and back of the block in a configuration that allowed for easy visualization of the events expected to occur in a tunnel during loading. To transfer the XCL loading of the instrument to the distributed loading, an aluminum plate was used. This design allowed us to confine the specimen in two directions and gave us the ability to observe the failure process through the cross-section of the tunnels. After we set up the frame and the cameras to capture failure properly at both three sides of the block, the load was applied on specimen by the aluminum loading plate. To accommodate minor abnormalities on the top of the artificial block, we placed a thin rubber sheet between aluminum top plate and the block to keep load vertical. We also painted the front sides of the block as with black speckle paint to allow us to capture the fracturing process with our cameras. One of the key points in the test was to assign a proper loading rate on the specimen since it could change the failure mode. A loading with a very low rate could potentially trigger strain hardening behavior in the material, whereas a loading rate that is too high would damage the rock unfavorably or make it fail at the outer boundary. 
Having a displacement controlled model in RS2 led to a selected loading rate of 0.05 mm per minute. The compressive loading test for the tunnel specimen was conducted using a stiff testing system, where the strand applies the displacement to the specimen and the reaction force was obtained from the machine. Additionally, acoustic emission sensors were fixed to the back of the specimen, one being above and one being below the pillar, to capture the events as they unfold during testing. At the beginning of the loading, the specimen remained intact and the rate of the increment for the reaction force was too slow. Therefore, we adjusted the loading rate from 0.05 mm per minute to 0.1 mm per minute. After 17 minutes at this new loading rate, some cracks were noticed along the tunnels. It was observed at this time that we weren't capturing acoustic emissions data that reflected the events unfolding. So we raised the sensor sensitivity and at this point and started to capture data. At 20 minutes, the side was started to spall. At 24 minutes, more violet failure in form of spalling occurred in the side walls of the tunnels and mostly around the pillar. It was observed that as loading increased, we observed progressive spalling and slabbing at the two sides of the tunnels. A notch shape failure was captured at the back of the specimen. At about 26 minutes, the specimen reached its peak stress. The test terminated when the reaction force dropped to the residual value. For the two tunnels, spalling was captured inside the tunnel walls. A horizontal crack occurred across the pillar between the two tunnels. Tensile failure was observed in the crown and invert and eventually the formation of larger through-going fractures. By removing the spall material hanging around the tunnel, V-shaped notches were observed in the zones of anticipated maximum tangential stress. This lab successfully re-simulated the failure of brittle rock around the tunnel under a compressive stress condition. A continuum model using finite element method embedded in RS2 was used to reproduce the failure process of the artificial material specimen under the compressive loading. The artificial material with the use of aluminum plates are explicitly simulated in this model. This failure mode was extracted when applied stress was around 8 MPa. An average value of vertical stress sigma yy at the top of the specimen was determined to estimate the reaction force. The simulated model has a similar failure mode to the actual tunnel specimen we tested within the instrument in the laboratory. Tensile cracks are initiated at the roof before reaching the peak stress. At the peak stress, the notches will form at two sides of the opening and through the center pillar. The tensile cracks at the roof and the floor of the opening extended axially. The average axial stress for at the top boundary was estimated at 3.42 MPa and the equivalent reaction force is around 386 kN, which is close to the peak force obtained from the instrument. Overall, the failure mode simulated in numerical model is similar to the lab observation. In a team of four, we successfully developed a brittle rock twin tunnel specimen that upon loading experienced failure as was anticipated. We selected an artificial material, found its strength and elastic properties, used these properties to establish a computer simulated model to develop a tunnel specimen and metal frame design for which we built and tested. Additionally, based on what was expected from brittle failure progression, spalling was captured at the side walls. The final geometry of the tunnels had V-shaped notches at their sides, and this is in close agreement with our numerical modeling results. The bending loading plate actually provides a higher stress within the twin tunnels area. However, the team believes that the uniformly distributed load will lead to a more realistic result. 
If we could recommend some improvements, we would suggest the use of a stiffer top plate as this would provide more uniform compressive loading to the top of the specimen. To prevent failure at the front and back faces, there could be face places added to the front and back of the specimen, making it a three-dimensional problem. 3D numerical modeling could also be conducted to predict spalling at the front and back faces of the tunnel specimen. We were unsuccessful with capturing all of the events that occurred with acoustic emission testing. It is recommended that close attention be paid at the start of the testing to ensure that acoustic emission data is being adequately captured. We were fortunate to receive helpful tips from Dr. Corkum's master student Ryan Zimbarth and PhD student Mehdi Gassimi, from Dr. Barani's master student Saeed Nasiri and Dalhousie University's technical staff Jesse Keane, Jordan Mayers, and Brian Kennedy, and from Dr. Corkum and Dr. Barani throughout this project, which was greatly appreciated. Versus the unconfined compressive strength.